Martha Wells has received a ton of well-deserved attention and accolades for her Hugo and Nebula award-winning Murderbot science fiction series. But what about the many fantasy novels she wrote in the 25 years before Murderbot? I'm Bridger, and welcome to the Library Ladder. This video isn't about the Murderbot Diaries, but let me just say that I think that series is a masterpiece, and I highly recommend it. It's both trenchantly funny and seriously thought-provoking. After all, what would you expect from a series featuring a half-human, half-robot killing machine who hacks its own operating system to give itself free will, but then discovers that it would rather lie around watching the equivalent of television soap operas instead of exacting murderous revenge on the humans who created it? It reminds me a bit of how Pixar's Wally learns what it means to be human by watching a video of the movie Hello, Dolly, only with more violence. Many of the elements that make the Murderbot series so enjoyable can also be found in much of Wells' earlier works. I want to share some of those books with you. Before becoming a writer, Martha Wells trained as an anthropologist. As a result, she has a keen sense of human interaction, of the importance of nuances and culture in societies, and of the ebbs and flows of civilizations over time. Her writing reminds me a lot of Ursula Le Guin's in its examination of the macro and micro behavioral dynamics that shape cultures and their histories. Wells's books generally aren't as thematically rich as Le Guin's, but the world she creates in them feel authentic and completely plausible, no matter how fantastic the story premise. Her writing style is a little on the Spartan side, more Hemingway than Faulkner, so there's very little purple in her prose. She tells her stories in a straightforward manner, providing plenty of descriptive information about her created worlds and characters, but without letting those descriptions sidetrack or overwhelm the narrative flow. It's not the beautifully lyrical writing of Guy Gabriel Kay, but it's highly competent writing that doesn't become a distraction to the reader. Her debut as an author was 1993's The Element of Fire, a wonderful standalone novel that might be her most traditional one. By today's standards, it's pretty tropey, but when it was written 30 years ago, it felt a lot fresher and more original. It's high fantasy set in a vaguely European-inspired world. It centers on the intrigues of a royal court. There are rival sorcerers of the good and evil varieties. There's a dowager queen who might have been inspired by Maggie Smith's Dowager Countess in Downton Abbey, if the book had been written 17 years later. And the Fae and their Seely and Unseely courts also feature prominently. Sound familiar? Yeah, I thought so. Nevertheless, I really enjoyed this book and I highly recommend it if you're looking for a bit of a throwback to traditional fantasy tropes done better than most. Ignore the embarrassingly bad cover art, though. This is not a book about a flying castle, and you absolutely should not judge it by its cover. Wells published three more standalone fantasy novels over the next seven years. City of Bones in 1995, The Death of the Necromancer in 1998, and Wheel of the Infinite in 2000. City of Bones is set in a post-apocalyptic distant future in which the world has been radically altered by a combination of thaumaturgy and heavy volcanic activity, leaving it a desert wasteland with isolated pockets of humanity living in fortified tiered cities barely connected to one another by the decaying roads of the ancients. This is where Wells really shows off her anthropology training. The world building is amazing, particularly when you consider that the book is only a little over 400 pages long. She deftly introduces us to a very complex world with its unique social, economic, and political structures, its radically altered environmental and biological ecosystems, and its mysterious history. And she does it organically as the story develops without resorting to clumsy info dumps. The world building reminded me of N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth series, with its geological devastation tied to supernatural forces, and with the air of mystery and uncertainty surrounding the gradual reveal of plots, motives, and histories 
that continue to shape the world. Jemison's narrative voice is very different, but it wouldn't surprise me at all to learn that some of her ideas were inspired by Wells. The story centers on a young thief who deals in antique relics. Imagine a cross between Locke Lamora and a young Indiana Jones. He's not quite human, though. He's a member of an outcast race of humanoids who were genetically engineered in the distant past to be able to survive the hardships of the desolate wasteland. He's hired by a mysterious member of the aristocracy to serve as a guide to an abandoned structure of the ancients out in the desert. From there, events rapidly unfold with plenty of intrigue, mystery, and a dash of romance. It's a fantasy novel that incorporates elements of other genres. It's a heist story. At times, it feels like a detective procedural story. There are hints of science fiction in it. Are the devices of the ancients magic? Or, paraphrasing Arthur C. Clarke, are they simply sufficiently advanced technologies? And it's a save the world epic. As in all of my book reviews, I'm going to refrain from going into much detail about the book and its plot because I don't want to spoil the experience for future readers. City of Bones packs a lot into a single volume and it shares certain themes with many of Wells's books. There's a likable but disaffected protagonist who's an outsider and other who doesn't fit into the society and culture. And there's a strong focus on cultures built on top of older, vanished cultures that are poorly understood and that lend an air of mystery to the proceedings. As some of you might be aware from my previous videos, I really appreciate fantasy authors who can write compelling standalone novels. The careful artistry required of authors to do standalones well, combined with the shorter time investment required of readers, makes standalones very appealing to me. Ironically, Martha Wells makes me wish for more than just a standalone. As I read City of Bones, I found myself wanting a longer story that would provide more opportunities to explore and really understand the fictional world she created and its history. Wells provided more than enough descriptive information to satisfy the needs of her story, but not quite enough to satisfy my own curiosity. To be clear, that's not a criticism of the book. I'm merely saying that if Wells ever decides to write a sequel to City of Bones, I would read it in a heartbeat. Wells' next book, The Death of the Necromancer, is a sequel to her first book, The Element of Fire, although it can easily be read as a standalone. The two novels share a common setting, the fictional land of Il Rien, but they take place many years apart and involve quite different social and cultural structures. Where the element of fire has a quasi-medieval setting, the death of the necromancer feels more like the Victorian era of the 1800s. There are a couple of brief allusions to the events of the earlier book in the death of the necromancer, but it's not necessary to read the books in chronological order. Their plots are mostly unrelated. They're also stylistically different. Whereas The Element of Fire is a more traditional high fantasy story, its sequel is a kind of multi-genre mashup. There are elements of high fantasy, of classic horror stories, of heist capers, and of Sherlock Holmes-style mysteries. It's a revenge story that elegantly morphs into much, much more. Again, Wells does an incredible job with the world building. Il Rien feels very well developed, despite having a name that translates as Nothing Island in French. It makes me wonder if she gave it that name as a call out to earlier works such as Thomas More's 16th century satire Utopia and Samuel Butler's 1872 novel Erwan. The Death of the Necromancer was a finalist for the 1998 Nebula Award for Best Novel, and that nomination was well deserved. Although many people consider this book to be superior to The Element of Fire, I don't quite agree. They're both outstanding books, but I actually enjoyed the first one a little bit more. But maybe I just have a soft spot for that kind of high fantasy story. Moving on to Wells' fourth novel, Wheel of the Infinite, we see her exercising her world-building muscles yet again. It's another standalone book, 
this time with a culture and magic system inspired heavily by Khmer beliefs and traditions originating in Southeast Asia. And again, like the earlier City of Bones, this is a really enjoyable book that left me wanting more. The societal culture Wells creates here feels far less familiar and tropey than in most fantasy works, and the rich world history embedded in the story is frequently hinted at but is never fully described. I want a sequel, or a prequel, that further explores this fictional world. So what's the book about? The story centers around Maskell, a middle-aged, disgraced former high priestess of the Adversary, the spiritual embodiment of justice, who is summoned back from exile to help salvage an annual ritual that, if it fails, could threaten the existence of the entire world. The ritual involves the completion of a sand mandala, known as the Wheel of the Infinite, that has the power to shape reality. This time around, though, the mandala has a flaw in it that keeps magically reappearing and growing, despite the efforts of the monks charged with protecting and completing it. Although the setting is very different, stylistically, this book feels a lot like our previous two novels. It has elements of other genres in it. Most notably, there's a mystery, or two, at the heart of this story, and much of the plot revolves around Maskell's efforts to solve those mysteries. Maskell is a wonderful protagonist. There's a lot of depth and complexity to her character. She's a little jaded and cynical, but she also experiences moments of self-doubt. Deep down, she's an idealist, but she sometimes sacrifices those ideals. At 45, she's young enough to still retain most of her physical strength and skills, but old enough to start questioning her longevity. She's formidable and fiercely independent. She's not afraid to kick butt and take names, but she has a softer, vulnerable side as well. She's a very untraditional heroine for a very untraditional fantasy story. I highly recommend this book. The ontology and cosmology at the heart of the story can be a little confusing at times if you aren't already familiar with Eastern philosophies, but Wells ensures that it all makes sense in the end. Of the four books I've discussed so far, this one was my least favorite, but that didn't stop me from enjoying it. It's a very good book. Following Wheel of the Infinite, she returned to the fantasy genre in 2011 with The Cloud Roads, the first book in a seven-volume series known as The Books of the Raksura that concluded in 2017. It's another world-building tour de force. This time, it's set on a completely alien world, and none of the characters are even human. The book has a lot in common with her earlier City of Bones in that the inhabitants of the world are not its original ones. They all live among the ruins of a much older and potentially more advanced civilization. The main characters are humanoids, known collectively as the Raksura, who have the ability to shapeshift into somewhat larger winged forms that have scales for skin and sharp fangs and talons. It's not entirely clear from the descriptions in the book what they look like, but the book's cover art and fan art provide some clues. Wells herself has referred to them in interviews as polyamorous flying lizard lion bee people, so you can use that as a guidepost as well. In the books, the Raksura are under attack from another closely related group of shape-shifting winged reptiles known as the Fell. The Raksura have the talent and temperament to create useful things and societies, while the Fell are naturally inclined to subjugate and consume anything or anyone they encounter. The story focuses on a young Raksuran named Moon, who was orphaned as a young child and grew to adulthood as an outcast and a loner. Moon suddenly finds himself in the midst of a colony of other Raksura, whose customs are completely foreign to him. He not only has to find a way to fit in with them, he also finds himself at the center of the conflict with the Fell. While the basic plot of the Cloud Roads shares a lot in common with many other fantasy stories, it's the world building in the book that really makes it stand out. The alien cultures are distinct and imaginative without being completely foreign, and the world itself 
is both fascinating and a little frightening. In a way, the world felt like a cross between James Cameron's Pandora from Avatar and Anne McCaffrey's Pern. Pandora, because of the incredible diversity of highly lethal flora and fauna found on the world. It's an eat or be eaten kind of world. Also, there's the mystifying presence of lighter than air islands of rock. The visual imagery alone is very reminiscent of Avatar. And it reminds me of Pern because of the nagging feeling I had while reading the book that it was actually a science fiction story disguised as fantasy with the main characters representing various species genetically engineered in the distant past by a lost civilization of humans. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I have to say that I've only read the first book in the Rexura series, so I don't know whether it turns out to be like Pern or not, and I don't know if the series ultimately is a rewarding one. I can say, though, that I really enjoyed The Cloud Roads, and I look forward to reading the next book in the series, The Serpent Sea. I hope you've enjoyed this brief overview of the fantasy works of Martha Wells. She's been writing high-quality fantasy novels for nearly 30 years, but has flown under the radar for most of that time. She deserves broader recognition, and not just for her recent Murderbot series. If you found this video helpful or entertaining, please click the like button. Please also consider subscribing to this channel by clicking on the library ladder icon in the bottom right corner. Thanks for watching.